there's no love here. No love whatsoever. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, today. And there, you've mixed up my notes. Um, what, what is... Nate, what is the BTU? Do you know the British Thermal Unit on an individual flame? Do you know what that is? Is it? Is it, it's not one, is it? I mean, does anyone know the British the BTU on? You know what? There, please do that, Greg. Yes, it's called Google. All right, we have. We remember where the the closest thing to omni uh, omniscient is Google. So look it up. What is the BTU of an individual flame? I, I think it's like one, is it? I, I'm not positive. One single little flame. I, I mean, does it really look like much? I mean, I'm, I'll just put it over here. Does this, I mean, it doesn't look too threatening, does it? I mean, there's four of them. That would be four BTUs. Um, you did well in school. I still need to tell you. I mean, it doesn't look threatening at all, does it? Here I am walking around as I told you I would, and so what? What does it say, Kyle? Huh? One flame has 50 BTUs. I mean, I don't know what you're so scared of. It's very controlled. It's in one space, one spot. There's no possible way that I could mess that up. <laughs> you know what? The problem with fire is that it's, it, it, to say that you can control it is, is just wrong, isn't it? Fire is probably the, the one of the most uncontrollable, um, I, I guess, blessings that God has given us. Um, these now four flames, and I was hoping to have a bunch of flames to illustrate something, um, very easily can get out of hand, can't they? I don't have curtains or anything like that. I don't know what in this building would actually burn. Um, possibly some of these, these trees are definitely the flag. But if you take one of these little... BT, one of these 50 BTU flames, now 200, and you set it next to something that's combustible, what would happen? It would burn. It would burn. It, and it would grow exponentially, wouldn't it? I would say it would rapidly fill this building up with black smoke, making it almost impossible for you to see. Um, and depending on how fast you all know that smoke rises and eventually it does what? It comes down. It would make it impossible for you to what? Breathe. And then it would make you, if you can't see and you can't breathe, it'll make you impossible to do what? To get out. And if fire moves, and it does, and you do not move, if the smoke doesn't kill you, the fire will kill you. Uh, there's been several times in my life, I remember as a kid, um, it wasn't my fault. There was a blessing here, I'll tell you what the blessing was. But um, we had sparklers, and we didn't have lighters back then. It's not that they didn't exist, it was just that nobody gave us kids lighters. We were deprived. So we had to go in to light our sparklers on the kitchen stove. And, of course, we're, we were good, responsible kids, so you had to run out really quick. You had to jump over the laundry piles, because we did the laundry in the, in the kitchen there. So you would light that. You would jump over the laundry piles like this, and you would run out there, and you would wave your sparkler. Well, we did that one time, and when we came back in, the laundry piles were on fire. The parents were not home. Imagine that, we're lighting sparklers on the stove and no parents are there. It would have been more strange if I said the parents were the ones lighting the sparklers, but they weren't, they weren't home. So I literally remember jumping into the laundry pile, jumping up and down, up and down to put the, I saved the house. Unfortunately, my blue polyester suit was consumed and I never got to wear it again. Polyester does not really burn. It, it doesn't, it, it kind of more transforms into something right there. So fire can be very dangerous. I don't know, some of you know this, my Uncle Bill was killed in um, an accident one time. He was changing the fuel uh, filter on a, um, 
a, a truck, great truck, I actually sold him, and fuel got on him. When he got out, we believe he lit a cigar. Um, that's the only thing he, he was. He was a, a, a big cigar smoker. He lit the thing, he caught on fire, and it was a guy across the way that saw him on fire, literally came, jumped on him with a blanket, wrapped him around it. What was it? You, you stopped the guy, and then you dropped the guy, and then you rolled with him. Uh, he, was, he was pushing 80 when this happened, went into the hospital, and what happened was, um, not to be too gruesome, and trust me, I was much more gruesome over there as I was talking about monkey poop snowballs to your kids. Um, you know, <laughs> it was a good story. Uh, it was like a hot dog. His skin kept expanding, and eventually he passed. Very, very uh, hurtful. So fire can be extremely dangerous. In, 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 in regards to a forest fire, have you ever watched firemen fight these things? You know where they do, what they do? They get dropped in to these forests that are on fire. They literally, they stand in front of the fire sometimes, and they fight it as it's coming towards them. And behind it leaves a what? A path of destruction. As I was thinking about all these things that fire could do, especially in light of the fact that I was going to have a sermon illustration full of flames, um, I thought, man, that all of those metaphors truly does apply, I think, to the culture that we live in to the church that we exist in, the American church, and to each as an individual. Anybody paying attention to the news? Chick-fil-A is the, is the recent battleground. I believe the owner who is a Christian, in fact, when it comes to good night, this company has been... They've really stayed pretty firm on their beliefs up to then. They, they don't open on Sunday. They're a very good Christian organization. They try to treat their employees very good. I've never had it. Um, it, is, it, is, it is really good food. But, what, but the owner came out, and he made a statement saying that he believes. I, I believe it was a positive statement, too. He didn't make any derogatory statement. He just says, I affirm the traditional marriage. That's all he said. That's all he said. And he was accused of being hateful because of this. He was accused of being um, promoting hate speech. And there are literally mayors in different cities calling for this business to be ousted. I got to tell you, I think it's extremely sad that we live, that we are, that we're seeing this with our own eyes. That government officials can bring down, I guess, uh, actions that are financially damaging not only to the people but to the employees just because of your personal beliefs. And though we have the freedom of speech, you can be punished heavily by secular society. But what is that? That is just nothing more than evidence that our culture is on fire. That and the backlash against conservative Christianity. Um, I've always thought, and maybe this, even since I was an atheist, how strange it was that, that and I think Randy kind of touched on this this, this morning, and I, I don't really want to bring this up or the whole entire conversation, but that there seems to be this, this fight in our culture against even the very presence of God. What Randy was bringing up, it's like, I don't believe in God, and I hate him, and they seem to always want to fight back. But that's just, really, isn't that just more evidence that our culture is on fire? And there's these, these battle lines that are extremely destructive to, to who we are. What happens, just, just had a question, could somebody, um, I, need, I need somebody to come up here, um, Andrew, come up here. I want you, we've done this before. I want you to go ahead and stick your finger into the fire for about two to three minutes. Don't put it out. No, for two to three minutes. No, just put it in the fire. Don't move it for two to three minutes. Okay, that's like three seconds. That hurt. 
I know, but for the, the, the um, for this to work, you're going to have to do it for so two to three minutes. But it's two to three right. minutes. Hold on. I got to stopwatch. Oh, okay. That'll help. Okay, clock, stopwatch, reset, and you're going to go for two to, th you want to put your finger in the flame. Don't put the flame out. Go. The, you, no, in the flame. That it was. No, it's not in the, in the flame. You do it. <laughs> go sit down. Well, this actually happened with my Uncle Bill, that w when your skin gets burned for a long period of time, you lose the ability to feel. Do you know that destroys all the nerves and anything? Anyone know somebody's been burnt or something? It, it's a horrible situation. Um, what was the famous shooting that happened in 1999? Columbine? Do you guys remember that, what happened? There were two kids who walked into the school and just started systematically shooting people. They were, I think, atheists too, or at least they had this animosity towards God with one of the kids. I believe her name was Rachel, wasn't it? Walked up to the, the, the girl and said, deny God or I will shoot you. And her response was, I can't deny him. And she was executed right then and there. It was very horrific. I don't know, you remember that? Do you remember how the entire nation went into this mourning for a long period of time? Now, if you will, just for a second, and this is just kind of evidence that I think that, that our culture is on fire, that, that it's really, it's in bad condition. And maybe we just don't, we're becoming burnt and desensitized to it. Recently, there was another shooting, right? An orange-haired, can I say deranged? Do you think, you think that's fair? Do you think he's evil or just more mentally just unstable? I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe both. He walked into a movie theater, and he killed the same amount of people. One of them was a little girl, six-year-old little girl. Um, just executed her. Uh, there were three men who stood up in front of him to protect their girlfriends and they died for being a hero. Very sad, very horrific. Have you noticed how the culture has, res how society has responded to this incident over the incident that happened in 1999? Maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'm missing something, but it seems as if it's not as shocking as it once was. And I don't know if it's because the news media, the 24-hour, seven days a week news media that we have, or the fact that this hasn't happened just the first time, but it keeps happening over and over and over and over again. We're becoming numb to the fact that our culture is on fire and that morally speaking, we are just in bad, bad shape. I have a cousin, and I hope he watches this sermon online who put on his Facebook the next day, I really want to go see this Batman movie. I heard it made a killing last night. And people liked it. Of course, some people said two words. They said, too soon. As if there was ever a time that could pass that we can make fun of a little six-year-old girl getting her brains blown out too soon. Our culture's on fire. It's burning. We're becoming desensitized to it. Do you see it? 
Some of you, the answer is no, because your heart has been hardened. See, some of you are arguing, you're, you're, you're making the fight to save marriage, and you're fighting like a fireman does, the front line, you've got the fire coming at you, and all you can see is that firewall coming to you, and you're, and you're part of the church, and you want to try to, try to save the culture, and you're fighting it, and, and you're arguing, well, what about um, this whole issue about same-sex marriage? We need to fight that right there. And you miss the fact that marriage has already been destroyed. My wife was opened up a magazine. She didn't buy the magazine. It was given to her. And we were sitting at, the, um, at, at our kitchen table. And um, uh, she said, well, this is a very interesting article. What was the premise behind the article, Dana? 40-year-old women finding that they no longer need to be tied to the family and that they are divorcing their spouses so they can finally live for what? For their self. What was the other article in the, in the magazine? Do you remember? I may be wrong on my statistic, but I don't think that I am. There are more babies being born today outside the marriage home than there were before. You're trying to fight to save marriage on a line where right behind it, it's already been consumed, it's gone. Some of you, are, you care very much about abortion, saving the lives of babies, but you know what? The sanctity of life is gone. How easily we hate people that wrong our, us for our rights, that we don't care for them. People in our culture and society, once they are just not useful to us, they don't benefit us in some way, we throw them away. We're getting to a point in our life that if people have certain, um, in our culture and our society, that if, if they're ge genetically um, uh, not correct, we're willing to throw them away. We'll eventually get to a point to our day that, you know what, maybe seniors, once they reach to a point that they're just no longer viable to us, why keep them? People feel useless and hopeless because once they no longer serve, society rejects them. Some people are worried about our culture burning, but I would submit to you this, it is already burnt. And it won't be saved. Here is the first point, and again, we are, this is an introduction to 1 Corinthians. I kind of want to put this into context, and I really want to say something that goes, that is the antithesis sometimes of how I personally feel, um, and it's just who I am and what I believe God's called me to do. I believe that we as the church, I'm going to say this slowly, I may say it twice, spend too much time worrying about the culture that we live in and not enough time worrying about the people in the culture. Let me say it this way. Sometimes we are like firemen worrying about saving a house but pay no attention to the people inside the house. We would spend much more of our time arguing why we need to save the culture and, and, and all of its institutions and marriage and, and, and the sanctity of life and forget that we are salt. You know what that means? That means we preserve a culture. Why? First Peter. So that we can slow down the destruction. Why? So that some people might be saved. But I think it's even worse than that. I think we pay sometimes too much attention to the fact that this culture is burning and not enough time on the fact that the American church is on fire. Where do we have the debates on morality when it comes to the church? Is it against the church and culture? It's inside the church today.
There are many churches in this community that think that you're outside of God's will, unloving if you hold to certain truths in the Bible. They're divided on that. The American church today is one of the most divisive organizations that we have on earth today. Spiritual gifts. Let me ask you something. How many of you have come from a church background where tongues were expected? One, two, three. How many of you come from a background where tongues were never to be spoken inside the church? One, two, three, four. Quite a few of you. We're so divided on spiritual gifts that we create denominations. We're on fire. We're on fire when it comes to uh, theology sometimes. There's some people who deny the resurrection. There's some people who, who um, say Jesus was nothing more than a good teacher. And I think that they're so far outside of uh, what the Bible teaches. That, you know what? They're, they're more heresy and they need to be stopped. But there are a lot of people that, that they build denominations based on what you believe about the, the, the um, uh, tribulation. We're divided. We're divided on the interpretation of Scripture. We're divided on leadership. We fight. We fight for our own rights. There are, and I've seen this over and over again, the fights that we have in church, and I'm not talking just about the American church, and generally I'm talking about the American church, all of Christians on the inside of, of, of America itself, but even in the churches that I serve at, sometimes the fights that I see are based on personal rights. This is deserved to me, and I'm going to fight to make sure that I keep it. We're on fire. Many of us would, would be willing to apply the law to other people, but demand grace for ourselves. We're on fire. We use worldly methods, don't we? Give people to, to, to give more money. I'll make you feel bad. What about worship? Worship has to be done in a certain way in a certain manner. You have to please me. And not what worship is supposed to be. An outward expression of love to a gracious good God. We're on fire. Is this something new? Absolutely no, it's nothing new. Everything that I just said is the outline to the Corinthian letters. Corinthians we're going to be in there for quite a while. It's an amazing letter, but you'll, if, if you just do a quick background uh, of the church, you'll see that, man, they were just like America. They really were. They were an extremely wealthy country, but yet they were morally bankrupt. They were very, very loose with their morals. Plato referred to prostitutes. Whenever he spoke of a prostitute, he, 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 he came up with this term, a Corinthian girl. Corinthians was just like us in the fact that they were extremely religious, as in the plurality of their religion was, I mean, it was. It was, it was very open to different religions, but they had no religious standards whatsoever. Let me, let, let me, let me uh, quickly on this. The church, the small church, again, the big church is, is all of Christianity. The small church is a group of believers in a specific location, okay? The church is a good snapshot of the culture in which you live in. Does that make sense? Here, let me do it this way. If this town was full of farmers and you came in here, you would expect to find a bunch of what? Farmers, right? If this town was full of lawyers, 
nothing but lawyers here. When you came into this church, what would you find? That's a trick question. Lawyers don't go to church. <laughs> Let me read to you what is said about the Corinthians. Paul was arguing about sexual or about immorality later in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Let me read this to you. He says, Do you not know the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Basically, what he does is he said, this right here is the culture. And from that culture, we pulled the best of you and we put them in. And this is what you are. But that's not my point. Here's going to be my point about the letter. And this is going to be the point I want you to take away from right here. This is a big one. Maybe even a change of direction. Are you ready? As bad as the culture was in this letter and in all the other letters, Ephesians and Galatians and Romans, Timothy, Titus, the Apostle Paul doesn't complain, he doesn't argue, he doesn't fight to try to stop the culture from burning. In fact, he cares very little about the society and the culture in which they exist to where he really never ever speaks of it. He does once in the first Corinthians letter, and this is what he says about the culture. He says this, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? God will judge those outside the church. But yet in this letter and, and all the other letters, and when Jesus was dealing with this, instead of the surrounding, the outside, which we, spend, we tend to spend a lot of time on, we focus a lot of time on, the Apostle Paul was like, deal with your own house first. Before you can start worrying about the culture that's on fire, make sure that the firehouse is not depraved. Do you think that the world sees the, the church as a bunch of hypocrites because we are so quick to scream at them, they are on fire, when all along we are too? One of the biggest complaints that you'll see in the church today is people say the church is irrelevant. You know why they say the church is irrelevant? Because they come into the church and they say, you're not that much different from us. What did Jesus say about a divided house? It cannot what? If it wasn't for the miraculous, Jesus' miraculous intervention, the church would have fallen a long time ago, especially if you trace it all the way back to the Corinthians church. But because Jesus promised, he said, the gates of hell will not overtake the church. I am positive that he is holding us together. Our culture is on fire and our church is on fire and there's a good chance the reason for that is because many of us is on fire. And I'm talking about moral depravity. The reason why our culture is on fire is because the citizens are on fire. The reason our culture, our society is morally depraved is because the citizens are morally depraved. It seems to reason that a reason why the church is morally depraved in so many areas is because the, sit, the, the congregation in itself is depraved. You know forest fires really don't exist. What are they? There are a bunch of individual trees on fire, amen? And you just see it from the hole. works the same way. How many of you really care if you spiritually grow in your Christian walk? And be honest, how many do you really want to become the, 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 the godly man, the godly woman that Christ called you to be? Or you just blowing smoke? I mean, do you just want to come in? And we, I mean, we can all, you know, we can take off our jacket, we'll get some strobe lights or something, we'll have a good time, we'll party, we'll drink coffee, espresso, because we're hip. Or do you want to become the saints that God has called you to be? Do you want to mature in your faith? You want to look back 10 years from now and say, you know what? God is so alive in my life. 
How do I know? Because I can see him moving. I can see him changing me. I can see him giving me a heart to love people. I can see him giving away that anger, the selfishness. I can see him just, he's changed me. How many of you want to go to your deathbed saying, I know because he's been so alive in my life. You've got to embrace the message that you're about to get over the next three, four months. Because here's the fact. The American church looks like the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church was worldly. And they were worldly because they wasn't following him. Three quick things, and I'll let you go. Very quick. These are the three things that I want you to embrace. before you even open up 1 Corinthians. Because if you can't embrace this, don't even try it. Ready? I'm going to hit hard. Some of these things that you, you know, you read in the Bible, but you just don't hear sometimes. Okay? Here's the first one. Write them down. You told me you wanted to take this seriously, didn't you? First, pastoral authority. Pastoral authority. Our culture and our society is consumer-based. And when I say pastoral authority, let me say ministerial authority. Okay? Our culture is a consumer-based society. And one of the problems that we have with the church today is people can walk into a church and, and, and they can put the weight of their Christian maturity on other people. He's not feeding me the way he should be feeding, as if I'm supposed to stand over your face with a baby spoon and force feed theology down your way and do it in such a tasty way that it makes you laugh at times. It, also, it is also a, 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 a world that we live in that if I were to come to you and say, you know what, you are, I'm going to tell you something right now, you are acting outside of God's will for your life. You can get so ticked off at me that you just leave and find another church. I think there are a lot of benefits from living in a culture uh, that is consumer-based, that it forces a, a congregation to give the very best. We should be doing that anyway, because it says everything that you do, you do for the glory of God. But the problem with that is there's no accountability. There is all the way to the world is put on the pastors and the ministers and the deacons and those spiritual leaders that God has put in your life to make sure that you become the person. They have to give an account on the day of reckoning for what you have done. And some of you, when, he, when they stand up, I think of uh, Brother Randy or Brother Nate. I mean, I see a lot of spiritual leaders here. Um, many of you are very consistent. Standing up front of there, I see them standing at the position of a in front of God himself and I see people coming up to them and they're going to be embarrassed. Why? Because you lived in an ungodly way and they had a spiritual fortitude to come up to you and say you crossed the line. Why? Because we were afraid our numbers would go down. This is not about numbers. This is about you growing. And, 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 and those people that God put in your, in, in your life, your deacons, your, your, your pastors, your Pastor Paul here, I mean, you've got to expect his spiritual leadership when you read the Corinthians. These brothers and sisters, if they are truly in God, they care for you. They cry at night because of you. They lose sleep because they want to see you become that person that God has called you to be. Pastoral authority. One. Two. God is faithful. Write that down. God is faithful. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 9 says this God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. 
We have a, a situation, and I will say it's a crisis situation because we have somebody who has been so disconnected from the body for a little over a year right now, and, and, and by the grace of God, you know, they're being drawn back, and as they're being drawn back within a couple of weeks, they're denying the faith altogether. I reject God. I reject him. And they're throwing the F-bomb like it ain't even funny. And it's just this hatred, this animosity, this anger, and it, and it truly does break my heart. And I live in a culture, and I live in a world where I tell you what, it looks as if, you know what, we're going the way of Europe. And one day, churches are going to be, hey, there'll be a great place to put your porn um, store into. Because they've been abandoned. And sometimes I look at the church, and sometimes, you know what, we've got our ups, we've got our downs. You know, we've got the, the summer, man, the summer, we've got pews that are empty. Oh, Lord God, what do we do? Woe is me. You know what, God is faithful. Didn't he begin a good work here? Yep. Didn't some of you get saved here? Yeah, I saw it. I was there. I dunked some of you. Some of you so big that when the water rose, went over my uh, trousers. I still got wet trousers from that. Not pointing out any names. Brother Nate, how you doing? God is faithful. It doesn't matter how bad it gets, God is faithful. Paul took everything into consistent. Yeah, you know the culture that you live in, it's horrible, it stinks. Oh yeah, by the way, the church that you are in is falling apart. Compare, I mean, this church, I love you people. You guys are, you guys are a really good church. I'm going to tell you, don't, I mean, don't, pat, you can pat yourself on the back, whatever. But this is family. I mean, we all have, we do, we have our shortcomings. There's areas that we could grow. Fellowship and commitment, that's the big one. Amen? Fellowship and commitment, that's where this church struggles, right? This, this commitment is, is, is there. But for the most part, man, there's no division, there's no animosity, there's fighting. Sometimes I wish there'd be more divisiveness, especially in business meetings. When we're talking about things that are vital, I want people to stand up and say, you know what, hey, this is a problem. We should have some, a little bit here. For the most part, it's good. This church had problems. There were people sleeping with their own mom. That's a problem. And I'm not talking just laying down. I mean, this is, we'll get to that. It's in there. She's shaking her head like I wouldn't say that. It's in the Bible. But Paul says God is faithful. And sometimes we need, we need God just to smack us in the head because we lose faith because, oh my goodness, Sister Joe didn't show up today. Woe is us. If he began a good work, he'll continue to do work. Here's the third word, and this is a cuss word. Getting ready? Here it is. Third word, cuss word. Submit. Isn't that a bad word in America? Because what? You're weak. Jesus Christ weak. Was he less? Here, here's a theological question. Was Jesus the Son of God less than the Father, Father or greater than the Father? Was Jesus less than the Father, or was he greater than the Father? John. The, the question, though, is he less than the Father, or is he greater than the Father? You talk about his office. Yes. It was an office of submission. It was an office of submission, but is he less than the Father, or is he greater than the Father? No. Yeah. Equal to the Father, yet... He submitted. And how did he submit? Unto death. Why? I don't know. <laughs> he loved us. But it's the example. I was at one church, and, and to this day, boy, I mean, and, and I can see the problem. I can see the problem. The church is full of, of, of a lot of godly women who have, who have held the ball, and, and, and they've, walked with, they, they, they've walked with Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. They're the spiritual leaders in the house, and a pastor comes up, and it's like the death knell to the pastor. When he starts preaching that one text, I think it's Ephesians 5.22, um, and sometimes the pastors don't preach Ephesians 5.21, but it says, wives submit to your husbands. You talk about pastors going to get 
executed right there. Are wives less, are women less than men? No, the Bible doesn't say that. Ephesians 5.21 says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Does John LaFont care one iota if Marcia grows in her faith? Does John LaFont care one iota if Kyle grows in his faith? Kyle, do you really care if Tamara grows in her faith? Do you want her to become a good godly Christian? Do you want her to? You care for her? Tamara, do you care if, if Annie grows in her faith and becomes more of that godly woman that she's called to be? Do you care for her? Would you pray for her? Paula, do you care if Nate? Amen? Do you brothers and sisters care about the brother and sister who couldn't be here today? Do you really care? Not so we get a warm button, a big number on the board, but just care. Well, there are people here that care for you. And they pray for you, and they cry for you, and they lose sleep over you. And they're looking out for you, and sometimes they look out for you more than they look out for their own best interest. The Bible says submit to that. Nothing wrong with submit. fact of the matter is you've got to submit to the Word of God. You've got to submit to God's calling in your life. I'm going to tell you the problem, and I'm closing on this. When a person's on fire, do they have any ability to reason? When you're on fire and you're running around and you're burning, do you ever get to the point to say, wait a second, what did they teach me in school? What was it? That's it. I have to stop running, first thing. <clears throat> okay, I'm on fire, I've stopped. What's the second thing I need to do? I have to drop. <clears throat> Getting old in my age. I ran some miles, so I'll get down there. All right. <sighs> All right, I'm on fire, I've stopped, I've dropped. What was that third thing? That's it, roll. No. You know who that's for, that stop, drop, roll? Andrew, stand up. Stand up, I'm not gonna burn you any more than what I already have. Come here. Sorry in advance to the people watching on video because we're about to break our microphone. But if I do break the microphone, they've got these really cool ones that come right out here. I want one of those. Andrew, my good-looking son. Thank you. <laughs> have, has anyone ever seen pictures of me when I was like 18, 19? <clears throat> the, did you ever see that? Man. Look at me. 30 years? I, I never know it, though. <laughs> I do shrink. Andrew, if he was on fire, burning, you know how much I love him? Stay there. <laughs> This is an illustration. Stay there. I don't want to break my mic. Uh -oh. Pretend you're on fire. Close your eyes. People on fire don't... I would stop him. I would drop him. And I would roll with him. Don't you love me? <laughs> <laughs> we all fall short of the glory of God. 
Some of us are so prideful we refuse to let the Holy Spirit stop us. We're so prideful we refuse to let him convict us and drop us to our knees. And we're so prideful that we refuse to let Jesus himself embrace us in this life and roll with us. As he puts us out. If you're serious, serious about growing in your faith, becoming a disciple, embrace this study that we have for a few months on Corinthians. Embrace the idea of pastoral authority, spiritual authority. Not people who are makers of truth, but conduits. Embrace the idea that God is faithful. He began a good work in you. He will continue. Embrace the idea of submission to him and ultimately to him alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. Father, your word says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Father, to, 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 Father your son says to, 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 to deny ourselves and to pick up our cross and to follow you. Father, the status quo is, can never be good enough. Father, we become numb sometimes to the moral depravity in this world, to the depravity in our own lives, in our own families, and in the own church, Father. We're not, and not only that, Father, but we, 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 we're not even more, it's not just about not doing the bad things, but it's about doing the good things, about becoming that, that person who's praying, Father, nonstop for their family, loving on them as they should. I know I fall short, Father. Being that godly parent, I know I fall short. Being that, that, that godly minister, I know I fall short, Father. But we grow, and we grow through submission to you. And over the next few months, there's not too many parts in this letter that just, it's a hard letter. We've got to deal with hard things. And some of this thing, many of these things may apply to us. Father, I'm confident, though, because I see these saints in this room, and they are their saints. Saints isn't this magical position that you get, Father. They are set aside, Father. You called the Corinthians saints. They are set aside for your purpose. I see the work that you've already done through them. I see the work that you're doing through them, that you continue to do. I am confident that you'll continue. Father, let this time of study Glorify you as it changes us, as it is used by the Spirit of Him on Most High. Change us. It is in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.